Good evening and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm your host, Eugene Chan. Our guest tonight is Mr. Andrew Leung, the current president of the 7th Legislative Council. He was also president of the previous LegCo and has served in LegCo since 2004 as the representative of the Federation of Hong Kong Industries in the Industrial First Functional Constituency. We've invited Mr. Leung here tonight to tell us if the new LegCo will be able to make up for the lost opportunities of the past few years. Welcome, Andrew. Good evening. Firstly, a heartiest congratulations to you being re-elected. We had your predecessors, Mrs. Rita Fan here five weeks ago, and also Mr. Jasper Zhang here a few weeks as well, show, uh, sharing with us a lot of challenges. And as an outsider, the last term must have been the most terrifying one because we actually witnessed the electrical building being vandalized and being, being damaged. What makes you want to come back for a second term? I think uh, with the enactment of the uh, new electoral law mm -hmm. and the national security law, uh, when we see now we have 90 members, right. uh, of which uh, most of them, 59 of them, are new. Mm -hmm. Although two or three have been previously uh, been a legislator. Uh, so I think we need a lot of help uh, to get them uh, on to you know, the mold of you know, normal natural. Uh, the second thing is that now that it's a new scenario with the enactment of both laws, uh, it's a new start and a new opportunity. And I think I'm glad to be re-elected as uh, natural president at yes. this you know, uh, very important juncture uh, for the future of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is why I think you know, uh, it's important. And also, unfortunately, you know, uh, we have not enough accommodation for all 90 members. So 45 of them have to be housed in the annex city building, you know, uh, next, next door. door. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have a major, you know, rebuilding process going on, uh, of which I've been working for the past year. Mm -hmm. So uh, continuing to be the electrical president would help smoothing uh, the way along with the next two or three years, uh, making sure the new uh, building uh, will be finished on time right. and then, you know, let all 90 members get back into the natural building. Right. Andrew, you know, as we also witnessed on the television that with the, the, the new swearing ceremony is much more smooth compared to the 2016 one, where there were a lot of um, so-called oath-taking protests, antics that happened during the time. And Priscilla Lung, your colleague, was here two weeks ago and she said it's a very moving experience when actually she sees the national emblem hanging in the last hall building. Why, why, why do we have this change of having the national emblem there at the, at the oath-taking ceremony? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we've been discussed with government uh, and CE uh, what is the best venue uh, for the oath-taking. Uh, finally, we come to conclusion that you know, uh, the best uh, venue would be in the electrical building itself. But under the law, uh, any of taking, we need to have the national emblem hanging on. The scenario is very simple. Three, four months ago, we order the national emblem. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we also order uh, the uh, 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 SAR emblem as well. Uh, the reason is that the two emblems cannot be the same size. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, the uh, uh, SAR emblem is uh, one meter wide. So we order a one meter emblem for the national emblem to replace that. Right. Meantime, we have to order 800. Right. A smaller one. Yeah, to show uh, the one country to system. To show the system, one yes. country to system. Right. Uh, but there's only one place where you can order that. And for three months, it was not delivered. Right. So uh, with uh, different opinion from various members, so we asked government, uh, the building services as well, to get hold of one and then put it there right. in time for the first meeting so right. that you know, we have the national emblem 
and the SAR emblem yeah. together. How do you feel when you see the emblem and you actually I see think the ceremony? It, I think it just put the constitutional uh, side, you know, in, at the right place. Right. We are one country, two system. We have the national emblem on top, and then you know SAR emblem yes. uh, beside it, you know, uh, and also the size will tell who's the mother country. Yes. We are only SAR. Right. So I think it's just putting everything back into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And also it gives the dignity uh, of the electrical uh, chamber as well. Right, I see. So Andrew, we, I also recently read about the joint statement of the electrical, 88 members um, condemning the European Parliament for the accusation and the resolution against Hong Kong. This must be the first time that you see such a united electrical against an outside uh, accusation. I think the accusation is malicious and far from anything far from truth. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be for us uh, electrical member come out, you know, united to, mm -hmm. you know, tell them that, you know, uh, really mind your own business and mm -hmm. you are not even having the facts right. Yes. Andrew, also, as you mentioned, you have a, quite a, a larger group now compared to before. Um, you have eight parties there, eight political parties, with a wide age range from 33 to 73. And there are more than half are of first comers. Do you think, I mean, how might they change the things, uh, how things will be discussed in the future? Would it be too many people talking about the same thing? I think uh, we now have a wider participation uh, the spectrum is wider, uh, the age, you know, differences is also huge. So it brings all the professionals, uh, different sectors, new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you have seen the first two meetings, you have new uh, faces with new ideas coming in. And I think that if we can harness this, all this, you know, uh, uh, different views uh, from that wider spectrum uh, and if government can listen uh, to the good points made by right. the uh, members I think it will make you know uh, the government and legislator you know executive and legislative you know uh, relationship a lot better yeah and also I think you know although we have more members but I think when we change the uh, uh, panel structures so that each one will have only 20 members, then they can have deeper in-depth discussion right. between the ministers and the Legislative right. Council yes. uh, instead of, you know, 80 mem uh, 40 members, 50 members, each one can only speak for two minutes, three right. minutes. Yes. yes, Andrew, I also look at some statistics and notice that actually there are more members of the Legislative Council that are not born in Hong Kong, like 21 members of current current term appreciably from mainland China. And we also have a new functional constituency in business, whereby they're representatives from the mainland Chinese companies. How would you see this new input <coughs> will would it bring better quality of debate and give us better suggestions to the government? I think the wider representation uh, will definitely bring a wider experiences, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, into uh, uh, electrical. I think uh, with people, they may not born in Hong Kong, but mm -hmm. they are Hong Kong citizens. They've been here for a long time. Right. Okay. Uh, and also, I think with the uh, uh, new, you know, uh, functional, you know, coming from the uh, mainland business sector, they represent, you know, quite a big chunk of Hong Kong's, you know, economic uh, uh, side as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to bring in their voices is also good. But if you look at that, uh, in future we are looking at the uh, 14, the fifth, you know, uh, uh, plans and also the uh, big Greater Bay area. I think inputs from them uh, will also tighten, you know, the relationship between Hong Kong and the motherland. Right. So it's very pleasing to note that you will you encourage I mean, the wide representation and give us more views. Now, much was talk about the, the lower turnout rate of the election to 30.2 per cent, but it has, been, it has been agreed that because it's also showed the support from the people, when we have a much higher turnout, it could mean a split of the society. But having that in, in mind, we still want the different opinions to be heard. 
Now the legislature is 1.89.1 because we only have one Dixie Yun who's supposed to put uh, the pandemic camp. How would you encourage this vacuum of, I mean, that we have pandemic for many years, how would you encourage that vacuum to be filled by the new 89 legislature or even the all 90 members? Well, I hope the vacuum will never be filled because, you know, uh, if you look at the last session, the pandemic, so-called, uh, just trying to stop everything moving and stop Hong Kong functioning. So I think with now, you know, we have wider representations and also with the legislative process, it's very simple. Government put up the bill and then when we scrutinise the bill, we will hear from every, all the citizens, their views. Uh, and then we deliberate with government uh, to try to amend some of the uh, views that may not be acceptable for, uh, from the, wide, the public. Mm -hmm. So I think we collect views from there, rather than collect views from those who want to damage Hong Kong and stop electrical functioning. OK, let's take a break and don't go away. Welcome back. We have been talking to Mr. Andrew Leung about the composition of a newly sworn LegCo. Let's move on to talk about the issues that most Hong Kongers most wanted to know. So in the first part, we talked about the current makeup of the LegCo, your views that we should have a wider representation, hopefully for more constructive opinions. So what are your personal expectations of the term LegCo? You've been a LegCo member since 2004. What would be your in your opinion, what should be the first priority on the let's go? I mean, the chief executive had mentioned some bills that they have put up, but what would be your, your own prioritised issue? I think the uh, number one issue is the pandemic, OK, COVID-19, especially the outburst, you know, uh, this few days. And I hope that, you know, the legislative councillor uh, can work together with government to try to, you know, uh, get that over. I think. Uh, once the pandemic is subside, then we can move back to normal economic, you know, uh, uh, activities, and we might, you know, have the uh, border open so that we can travel, you know, uh, uh, normally at least to uh, motherland. So that is number one issue. Now, the legislative agenda is the onus of the government. Uh, they will just have a. Uh, give us 37 bills that they want to uh, send. So each bill need to have time to go through all the processes. Uh, and the third uh, issue is that the uh, CE mentioned that you know uh, she want to restructure uh, some of the ministries, yeah, the, the uh, which is a good uh, way of you know uh, moving forward uh, for the next government. So we need to. Uh, work that out, you know, before uh, the next, you know, uh, uh, CE come on. Uh, come on. So I think that already is a tall agenda for legislator and the government to work together. So even the, uh, the, the current term of government comes to the, the final six months, so there's still a lot of work to be, to be done. Um, I want to ask you that You've been in LegCo for so long. We know that the House of, uh, ru uh, House of uh, Rules of Procedures and House Rules has been amended a few times in the last few years. Has our LegCo still had teeth, especially in the Year of Tiger? Uh, obviously, I think we are working together with government, like cop wheels or gears, you know, working together. Uh, in the past term, I think some of our members have tried to stop you know, one yes. wheel, you know, moving. Uh, and that's not healthy at all. I think we need to work together with government. Uh, we will, you know, uh, 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 monitor, you know, uh, uh, the activities. We have to write, you know, uh, in basic law. But then we need to work together with an executive-led government uh, to scrutinise, you know, the bills, to scrutinise the budgets and things like that. But we need to do it in a constructive manner and give our opinion and not, you know, like the 
always a very destructive uh, way to stop government functioning. Mm. So, Andrew, you know that the legislator have met Mr. Xia Baolong, mm. and he has mentioned five criteria to be uh, advised to the, the new legislators. Do you think that five, such as they have to affirm patriot to make sure uh, protect national security, they have to be a protector of the executive-led government, as you just mentioned, a true representative, a representative of a people, be diligent and be united. Do you think, that, firstly, can they do it? And secondly, would they be able to catch up on all the lost opportunities that we had due to all this unreasonable filibustering and calling quorum, etc., etc.? Now, the first thing, you know, uh, Shapo, uh, five wishes is a universal standard. I mean, it, not only to Hong Kong, you know, a legislator is right for every legislator or, you know, congressman uh, in other countries. Right. Uh, once you become a legislator, you have to follow that. Mm -hmm. uh, no legislator, you know, become a traitor to their own Country. government. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, to speak out for the people is a universal norm as well. So I think it's a very timely reminder for our legislator, newly you know, uh, elected legislator, that you know, this is what we need to do for Hong Kong people. Yes. I think we come to become legislator not for ourselves, but for, for the, the betterment people. of Hong Kong yes. and the Hong Kong people. Yes, President. It's very encouraging to see that the last term of uh, legislative council passed 48 bills, which is double the average of what they did in the average the last two years, with 42 members. But now you have a team of 89, including yourself 90. And if you're going to hear everybody, times 90 people minus one, times 7.5 minutes each, it's going to take you seven and a half hours just to listen to them. How can you ensure that all of them have a chance to speak up and be able to have follow-up questions, like the recent uh, meeting which, with um, CE coming to the uh, latch school. It was one and a half hours. It was extended to two hours. And 17 members spoke, and Rebecca Chen was saying that she didn't get a chance to have a second chance. So maybe you can tell the viewers, how are you going to ensure all these different voices can be heard and uh, work I, effectively? I think, you know, in latch school, we have a system uh, of, you know, those members who have asked less questions will have more priority. Right. Uh, and also, I think in the electrical, now with the uh, change of rules of procedures, that we want to divide responsibility so that you know, each one uh, uh, panels will have a maximum of 20 people instead of in old days can be you know, 60, 80, uh, 60 people. Right. Okay? So their voice can be heard you know, a lot easier. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, also with the change of rules of procedure, the speaking time is a bit less. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, given, you know, uh, members, you know, if they can use their time well and let other people have the opportunity to speak, uh, that is, you know, uh, uh, quite, you know, better yes, for everybody. Yes. Uh, with the, you mentioned that when um, the first question being asked, you know, uh, the whole question and answer span only 13 minutes. Yes. Uh, the first half an hour, we uh, see you only answer three questions. Right. But after I you know, remind members that they should not voice their opinions, mm -hmm. they should ask you know, shorter right. questions, the next hour, we have 14 right. questions. Right. So you can see that... You know, the difference already you, made. Yes. You already, you, we, can, we need to give more opportunities for right. other members uh, so I think it's a fair system. Right. Andrew, um, in our show, we have been talking about different matters in Hong Kong. One of the things that attract a lot of attention is the huge inequalities, especially the housing issue in Hong Kong. And in the recent news article reported the asset declaration forms of the legislators, almost 77% of electrical members say uh, have property owners. And nearly half of them have a property in the mainland or overseas. So how can you, or how confident are you, that they'll be putting aside their own interests and work for the other 49% of the Hong Kong people who don't have a property? I think, you know, the uh, property market, you know, uh, is a deep-seated uh, problem. I think uh, we need to solve it in different ways and come up with new ideas. Now, the uh, 
northern metropolis, you know, is 300 square miles. Mm -hmm. It offers a lot of, you know, opportunities as well. Uh, and also we need to streamline the government, you know, bureaucracy that, you know, land can be available in a shorter time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think there are so many things that we need to work out. Right. Uh, so with the new legislature that with all members from different fields, we hope that, you know, new ideas, new chemistry can come up to help government making more land available uh, for people who would like to have their own properties. Right. Yeah, it's very reassuring to hear that. Uh, just very briefly, we have been here reading the news that Article 23 is going to have a consultation soon. And, and what is electrical role in this? I mean, we had a, a big uh, turmoil in the back in 2003. How do you see the current legislature? Would it be passed through smoothly? What is your anticipation? Well, I think it's under our constitutional duty that we should legislate uh, for the Article 23. Mm -hmm. So uh, government already said that they would start, you know, uh, uh, in the first half, you know, the uh, consultation to the wider public. Mm -hmm. And after the consultation, then they will come to the Legislative Council uh, to present the bill. Mm -hmm. So I think while they are consulting the public, I think the legislator would also hear the voices of the public and then they will reflect it during the scrutiny of the mm -hmm, bill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I hope that, you know, uh, with the national security law being uh, enacted, uh, this time, you know, uh, the bill would be, you know, uh, going on, you know, uh, through electrical smoothly. But I think, again, we need to consult the wider right. public. Last question on you for tonight. As, as a president of Legislative Council, you are ranked seven on the government's list and you have worked with all past four CEs. And as you know, each of them have their own individual characteristics and their challenges. You know, the upcoming CE election is going to be end of March. At this stage, no one has put a hand up except Mr. Sin. Um, with everything in place now, in your opinion, do you think whether it's going to be a female or male or whether the, the contingency or new person would that person be able to catch up all the lost opportunities that we had in the last few years, do you think? I think with the new legislator who is a lot friendlier with the executive, uh, anyone who have Hong Kongs in their heart uh, and is able and willing to spend the next five years to work for the mm -hmm. betterment of Hong Kong would be suitable uh, to be the chief executive. Thank you. Andrew, many thanks for joining us tonight. It is pleasing to note that the new electrical will, will endeavour to catch up on Hong Kong's lost opportunities in the upcoming four years. Thank you for watching and good night.